We are looking at 12.4 and specifically dialysis and how it works. Well, dialysis is basically an artificial kidney and you may have to go on dialysis if you have kidney disease or kidney problems, a failing kidney, um, any of those reasons. And so how it works is this. Basically, you're gonna take blood from the artery. It's fed out through a tube, which is similar to the Fisken tubing that you used in the last experiment. Then what happens is a pump pumps the blood along within there and an anticoagulant is added. We want to stop that blood from clotting. Remember, when blood comes into contact with a rough surface, the platelets become sticky and they begin to clump together and clot the blood. So even if you take blood from somebody's arm and you, like when you go to the hospital, and you pour it into a glass cylinder, that is rough, that smooth glass, uh, is rough to the blood and it will start to clot and that's why you'll see the person taking from the blood from you looking for the right um, test tube to put your blood into because that is also coated with an anticoagulant. So the blood is pumped through the machine and we've got a large surface area here um, and of course the tubing is semi-permeable so it's going to allow uh, small substances to pass through it and keep the big substances inside. Um, it, Running in a counter current manner to that, what we've got is the dialysis fluid. And we've talked about this before, how because it's running opposite, we're gonna make for a more efficient diffusion um, surface. It maintains the concentration gradient along the whole length. So that's actually really important. If you're looking for a high grade, you need to be able to explain the countercurrent mechanism whereby it's more efficient because the diffusion gradient is maintained over the whole length of the tubing. Well, of course, this dialysis fluid needs to be refreshed and needs to be changed because we're relying on diffusion. Um, and so once those substances diffuse into the dialysis fluid, we need to change that. So let's have a little think which substances would diffuse out. Well, we don't want to lose glucose from our blood. So the best way to keep glucose inside this tubing, because of course, glucose is a monosaccharide, it's one molecule, it's very small and it's very soluble. We want to keep it inside the blood. And so the best way to do that is to put glucose in the dialysis fluid. That way, there'll be no net, no overall movement of the glucose out. Salts, you might have consumed a lot of salty food and you need to remove those salts from your blood. And the best way to do that is to put salts in the dialysis fluid. Why? Because salts will move out until the concentration is the same inside the blood and outside in the dialysis fluid. So we're getting it to the optimum, getting it to the ideal concentration. Urea, however, won't be contained in this dialysis fluid. Um, because we want to get rid of that from the blood. So it will pass out into the dialysis fluid. Now we need to change the dialysis fluid because otherwise, if we kept the same dialysis fluid in there, we'd get to a position where it was in equilibrium with that of the blood. It would be 50-50. And we want to get all of it out if possible or as much of it out as possible. And so by changing this spent, this used dialysis fluid, we're going to achieve that. And then of course the blood comes back out and around. You may be asked to explain that in an exam question. And also simple things like being able to label this diagram uh, are important. In last year's exam, I saw that they asked students for the name of the fluid that bathes the blood in this system. And of course the answer was just dialysis fluid. So just looking at that countercurrent, mechanism again. What we've got going on is if you had a parallel mechanism then we're going to find that if the concentration of say salts or solute in here was 100 and in here it was zero then it would move across okay so then we would go down to maybe 75 and this would be 25. Again there's a concentration gradient so the solutes would move across. So we'd go down to 50 and maybe down to 50. Well, at that point there, you're stuck 
and the remaining length of whatever exchange surface you've got, then there's going to be no net movement either way. We're going to remain with 50 and 50. It's going to stay the same. So it's not an efficient way to move substances. So this is the parallel method. If we look at the countercurrent method, change that. Keep it the colour scheme. Okay, so countercurrent, it's moving opposite like this. So whatever it is, it's coming in at zero there and it's going in at 100 there. So even if this continues to lose 75, 50, 25, let's even make it a bit more extreme. Let's go 10, let's go 5, we still have a concentration gradient. Even at this low concentration here, it will still move over to there. And then that might become five, and then that might become 10, and then that might become 50. And then at this point here, that's gonna move over and that would become 60 and then that would come over and that would be 90. So in terms of your language, counter current flowing in opposite directions ensures a more efficient exchange and it maintains the diffusion gradient along the length of the exchange surface. So if you've got chronic kidney disease, you're going to need hemodialysis or dialysis as we call it. You're going to have to go to the hospital for three times a week and you're going to be hooked up to a machine and you may be there for between eight and ten hours at a time. Now clearly this has a lot of problems. Uh, how do you go on holiday? How do you look after your family? How do you work? when you've got to put so much time into being on dialysis. And not only that, but you can be on dialysis for lots and lots of years. Sadly, being on dialysis can put a significant strain on the body. If you're 20 and you start dialysis, you can expect to live about another 20 years if you remain only on dialysis. And if you're old, if you're about 75, you may only have two or three years left of life expectancy because of the strain it puts on your body. However, it is important to be aware that survival rates have continued to improve and will continue to improve in the future. Okay, so while you have to go to the hospital for uh, three sessions a week, there are also four days that are free. Each session will usually last about four hours. This has improved. Back in the day, it used to be as long as 10. If you do travel to a different country, then you need to plan in advance which clinic you will attend. Another disadvantage is that your diet now becomes particularly important and the amount of fluid that you drink also needs to be restricted. People on dialysis are advised not to drink more than a couple of uh, cups of fluid a day. So from this video, what can you do? I would make a six steps that explains how uh, dialysis works. And what I would do is make a table of advantages and disadvantages of going for dialysis. So join me in the next video where we'll consider kidney transplants and we'll also compare transplants and dialysis. We'll look at the cost implications and the lifestyle implications and we'll also go through some past paper questions to see what you could be asked in an exam.